Thanks everybody uh, for joining us today for our Upgrade Oncology Pathology Series session on salivary gland tumors. We're very excited to have um, Dr. Esther Rossi from the Anatomic Pathology and Histology Division of Catholic University in Rome, Italy uh, to talk to you today. Uh, as always, uh, we are recording the session. It will be available on demand after the session is over. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and if you have technical problems, put those in the webinar chat. Um, I will now turn it over to Dr. Rossi. Okay. Um, good, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where uh, you are. I'm uh, Dr. Rossi. I'm from, uh, from Italy. I work in the Catholic University and my major uh, uh, focus are on uh, endocrine pathology, both uh, psychology and histology, and uh, especially in the hand and neck uh, salivary lesions, so cytology and histology. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is uh, to um, introduce uh, the um, salivary cytology, um, focusing uh, on the different categories uh, of the Milan system, and of course, uh, also the updates uh, related uh, to the upcoming uh, second edition uh, that will be published uh, in uh, July uh, 2023. In this moment, the proof of the um, of our uh, second edition uh, is in the um, in the end of the spring or uh, after the revision uh, of the proof. Uh, who? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I I'm very keen on uh, liberal heart, so you will see some references uh, to movies uh, and also some paintings. Uh, and I would like to start uh, in this way with this uh, movie Point Break because uh, the classification systems, uh, not only of course uh, the Milan system, uh, may represent a Point Break uh, comparing with the classic and the usual uh, uh, cytology. But why had the neck cytology? The uh, fine needle aspiration in the salivary gland um, is a uh, rapid uh, uh, and, and the safe method uh, with a few complications. Um, it offers uh, a preoperative distinction in the majority of benign and malignant lesions uh, at around 80% of them. Uh, sometimes with a specific diagnosis in the majority of cases. And it also helped to reduce the need for a frozen section. And it represents a valid aid in the conservative management for benign and low-grade malignancies, but also more aggressive or palliative treatment in high-grade lesions or, of course, metastasis. Um, we have to say that uh, according to the literature, uh, there is a wide range of uh, sensitivity from 62 to 97 percent, a pretty high specificity from 94 to 100 percent. And uh, mostly we have a very high diagnostic accuracy for some specific uh, benign lesions, so for instance, uh, pleomorphic adenoma or working tumor. Uh, but it is lower for malignant tumors, and especially the accuracy of time-specific diagnosis of malignant lesions is quite poor. This is due to the heterogeneity of this tumor and the morphological overlaps among several of them. But there are good news because the majority of the lesions are benign masses or inflammatory diseases. They represent around 80% of all lesions. And carcinomas, as you can see, and lymphomas are only 10% of salivary FNA, with the remaining 5-10% representing, of course, some non-diagnostic or inadequate rate. Uh, this is uh, generally speaking, but of course, we have to remember that we have some differences uh, according uh, to the different salivary gland. If, for instance, uh, we consider the parotid gland, the majority of lesions are benign, 80% versus 20%. If we consider the somandibular gland, we have half and half, 50% uh, benign, 50% malignant. If we consider the sublingual or minor salivary gland, more than 80% of them um, are represented by malignant lesions. So we need to keep it in mind. 
Different uh, authors uh, published uh, systematic review about uh, the uh, FNA and the correlation uh, between cytology and histology, as in this uh, uh, study, including more than 2,000 cases, uh, in which you can see there is a very high cor uh, accuracy, uh, especially for malignant lesions uh, higher than 93% and benign lesions, uh, but it is, uh, as expected, lower for non-neoplastic or normal tissue at around 65%. In this review article by uh, Tiagin Day, published on diagnostic cytopathology, you can see in this table uh, all the possible issues uh, with uh, and the diagnostic problems in salivary cytology, including uh, sampling error. So we might have some fibrotic or uh, hyalinized uh, tissue, necrotic and hemorrhagic component, or simply the fine needle aspiration is not inside the lesion. But also we might have some issues with the cellularity. Of course, if it is a pausy cellular smear, so the issues are with non-diagnostic or non-representative. But also we might have some issues in case of the cellular smears. For instance, sometimes it's very difficult to recognize pleomorphic adenoma versus basal cell adenoma or even basal cell adenocarcinoma. Also, we have to consider the heterogeneous nature of salivary gland neoplasms. The fact that some low-grade tumor, for instance, a scenic cell carcinoma, may mimic a normal salivary glands because the cytology is very bland in some cases of uh, um, a scenic cell carcinoma. But also we might have some problems with, as we will see, with the cystic lesions or lymphoid rich lesions. And we have to remember that some entities have this lymphocytic infiltrate. But also it's impossible on cytology to discriminate between benign versus the malignant nature of some specific type of tumor. For instance, myopithelioma versus myopithelial carcinoma basal cell adenoma versus basal cell adenocarcinoma. And why? Because on cytology, we are not able to recognize a capsular and vascular invasion. But also we have to remember the overlapping cytological features among different entities. For instance, highline globules, which are typically seen in adenoid cystic carcinoma, can be um, focally present also in pleomorphic adenoma. And we need to remember this, or the clear cell pattern, which is in common now with many different entities, or squamous metaplasia, oncocytic changes in benign and malignant entities, and of course, the spindle cells. When we started to think about this classification system, it seems to be a mission impossible, but we should know that as for heat and ant, until now, nothing is impossible. So it was for the Milan system, which was published in February 2018. But why a classification system for salivary cytology? If you think we had, when we started to think about this classification in 2015, we had different classification system for thyroid, for urine, for breast. So we started to think about the idea for a classification for also salivary cytology. And if you think since the end of the 18th century, also Lavoisier, a French chemist, underlined that in order to improve a science, we need to improve the language and the nomenclature related to, of course, that science. But also more recently, Leopold Koss, one of the fathers of cytology, reported that the records and the diagnosis should be expressed in a simple language that can be easily understood by the clinicians. So try to improve the, of course, communication. And um, also in different uh, papers, uh, uh, we had uh, this uh, frequent uh, question, is it time to adopt a classification for the parotid, but in general for salivary cytology? When we started to think about it, uh, again, was during the USCAP 2015 in Boston, uh, there was uh, a confusion concerning cytology. Diversity of diagnostic categories or 
descriptive reports without categories or even worse, the use of surgical pathology terminology adapted on cytology. So when we started to think it was uh, one of my ideas uh, during, uh, the, uh, during a dinner uh, in the lobby of the Ayrton, so you can imagine what can be done also in, uh, uh, in a bar, there was uh, among us there a general agreement uh, on the need for a defined set of diagnostic categories for salivary cytology for different reasons. First of all, improving the communication, which means at least improving also the cancer risk, but also improving the exchange of data across the different institutions. So try to think, try to speak a common language. This was the beginning of the Milan system, but why Milan? Because the first meeting of the core group of the Milan system was during the European Congress of Cytology, which likely, I have to say, in 2015 was held in Milan. So as for the Bethesda thyroid and the Paris system, we decided to use the name of the place in which we had this uh, first meeting. The Milan system is a, a um, classification system sponsored by the American Society and the International Academy of Cytology. In our intention, Dr. Faquin and I, but all the, of course, uh, others of the Milan system, wanted a practical classification system that would be user-friendly and internationally accepted. The uh, system is an evidence-based system with a useful format for the clinicians. We started analyzing all the papers um, published since 1980 to 2017 when we uh, finished uh, the revisions of the atlas. And uh, uh, the classification system and the risk of malignancy, of course, for the different categories were refined according to the literature. There are several benefits when we think about a uniform classification system, not only for salivary cytology. First of all, we improve communication between pathologists and clinicians, which means at the end, speaking a common language and improve patient care. But also, we, uh, it, uh, it is able to facilitate the cytohistological correlation and of course, promote also research into the different field, epidemiology, molecular biology, pathology, and the diagnosis. And also foster sharing of data from the different studies, from the different laboratories for collaborative studies. In this moment, there are several studies concerning the Milan system, including the different institutions involved in it. This is the core group, and this is during the meeting in Milan. We have two editors, Dr. Fakwin and myself, uh, the two on the, on the left, and then several uh, associate editors from all over the world. We try to be as much inclusive as possible. And this is the classification proposed with, as you can see, six diagnostic categories so that we are going to describe, non-diagnostic, Non-neoplastic, atypia of undetermined significance AUS, neoplastic benign and uncertain malignant potential SAM, suspicious for malignancy, and malignant. This is the general scheme of the Milan system. We have more than 40 contributing authors from all over the world. The majority are cytopathologists, but we have also surgical, molecular pathologists, and the next surgeons. This is the general scheme, including 10 chapters. The first, as you can see, is an introduction and an overview of diagnostic terminology. Then the six diagnostic categories uh, previously introduced, a specific chapter for ancillary studies in salivary cytology, a chapter about the clinical management written by surgeons, and chapter 10 is about the histological considerations according also to the um, WHO, uh, and it was written by a common friend, uh, Dr. Bruce Vanek. 
This is uh, the first meeting during the USCAP uh, the next year in Seattle 2016. Part of the Milan group was there, of course. This was in San Antonio the, uh, in 2017. In this moment, uh, we already had uh, the uh, proof of the final uh, uh, chapters. And uh, let's analyze uh, the classification and uh, the different uh, categories uh, and the criteria. And I would like to start with this um, uh, table, which is the core of our Milan system. You can see the different uh, diagnostic uh, categories uh, combined with uh, a risk of malignancy for each of them and uh, a specific uh, management. This is a practical classification system, so we wanted to combine the categories with a risk of malignancy and a management to give practical information to the clinicians and, of course, to the patients. The first category is non-diagnostic. As you can imagine, this is used when we have an insufficient qualitative or quantitative cellular material to make a cytological diagnosis. There should be less than 10% of the whole, of course, the FNA. And we specifically define different criteria, including also aspirate with benign halimils and also non-mucinal cystic contents. You can see here some examples. For instance, in the upper left, we have a, um, a sample uh, in which we do not have material. Or on the right, we have some artifactual uh, evidences. So this uh, hampering uh, the evaluation of the cells. But also we have to include in non-diagnostic uh, this sample on the, the, um, on, the uh, on the bottom, on the left bottom, in which you can see we have a typically uh, acenic cell. So this means that in presence of a lesion uh, clinically or radiologically defined, we uh, did not uh, um, um, have a, a finidal aspiration in the lesion, but on the normal uh, uh, parenchyma. And also on the right bottom, you can see some macrophages, uh, and this is a, a cystic uh, um, uh, lesion. As for the Bethesda and other classification system, we, of course, have some exceptions that cannot be defined as non-diagnostic. For instance, in case of even few clusters in which we have uh, some uh, um, very subtle atypia, and even if we have a few cells, these cells cannot be defined as non-diagnostic, so they should put in the category, as we will see, of atypia of undetermined significance. But also, if we have only tumor matrix or chondromyxoid stromal component, which is typically seen in pleomorphic adenoma, this cannot be defined as non-diagnostic. But the most important is the evidence of mucinous component. Even in absence of, cell, of cells, this cannot be defined as non-diagnostic. The evidence of mucinous component can be associated to a benign lesion, such as a mucosil, but also can be associated with, for instance, a, um, a MAC, in which uh, we have uh, the... Um, we, we, we we, we added a definite aspiration only on the cystic component with mucinous material. The risk of malignancy, sorry, for this category uh, is uh, between zero and 20%. The second category is non-neoplastic. This is a use for all the entities or samples lacking evidence of a neoplastic process. So we including all the different inflammatory, metaplastic or reactive conditions, for instance, acute, chronic, and granulomatous, sialadenitis, sialadenosis, and so forth. In some cases, we might have also some reactive lymph node, and also flow cytometry could be considered in some of them. I would like to mention that um, uh, in the parotid, uh, we might have some lymph nodes, uh, and of course, we might have some reactive lymph nodes. Uh. In some cases, it's difficult to recognize our reactive uh, lymph nodes, so flow cytometry might, uh, flow cytometry might be helpful. Uh. It's essential for this category, a clinical radiological correlation in order to ensure, of course, that the sample is representative of the lesion. 
And here you can see some example on the left, uh, um, upper and bottom, you can see two cases of acute sialadenitis. Usually it is not so frequent to have a, a, um, an acute sialadenitis in which you recognize a neutrophil and the eosinophilic component because it is associated with some pain. So there is a, a drug treatment before the FNA. By the way, in some cases, they perform an FNA and you can see that there's uh, um, this amount of inflammatory, acute inflammatory cells. In the uh, upper right, you can see an example of a chronic uh, cyanodenitis in which usually we have some some uh, um, uh, um, inflammatory component uh, in the background and uh, very few and uh, uh, minimal uh, epithelial uh, component, ductal cells, uh, which uh, have uh, um, uh, very uh, bland, of course, uh, cytology. In some cases, we might have also squamous metaplasia. And another example is uh, the um, lymphoepithelial cyanodenitis that you can see in the right button. Um, it is not so difficult to recognize this entity because usually we have a small lymphocytes and epithelial cells with the squamous metaplasia percolating, percolated by this small uh, lymphocytes. The risk of malignancy for this uh, category is at around 10%. Of course, in the atlas, we describe all the different and possible type of sialadenitis with criteria, with PIC pictures and also with the possible differential diagnosis. But let's move to the most uh, uh, tricky category, which is the atypia of undetermined significance. This category was uh, introduced as uh, uh, based on the same example from the thyroid, from the paris, and so on. Usually, we included the cases um, in which we have uh, limitations uh, in quality and the quantity. And of course, uh, the few cells uh, that we have uh, uh, due to the nature of the lesions uh, or due to the FNA uh, might, uh, um, are, uh, might uh, um, have some issues uh, in the identification as reactive uh, or neoplastic. And in fact, we cannot exclude a neoplastic condition. So basically, this is a an heterogeneous category in which, uh, due to these uh, limitations, uh, we are not able to recognize as reactive or neoplastic. The majority, by the way, will be reactive atypia at the end, or maybe fully sample neoplasms. Sometimes uh, we have a few cells or samples that are compromised due to a drying blood clot, so we are not able to recognize the morphology of the few cells. By the way, this category should be less than 10% of all fanidal aspiration, so we want to avoid that this is a waste basket and you put there uh, uh, whatever. Uh, here you can see the uh, some of the criteria, but I would like to introduce them with some specific example examples like this. For instance, in the upper left, if you have very few cells uh, as this, which are enlarged with some pleomorphic and irregular nuclear membrane, but we have a few of them very isolated. So, um, and it's not enough to describe this as neoplasmic. Plastic, we have to describe this as a typia of undetermined significance, which in the majority of cases will mean that it's not enough, the material, and maybe uh, it will be repeated, of course. But also, we might have a very scant epithelial cluster like this, with this epithelioid appearance, and so not enough for a neoplastic diagnosis. And, uh, mm, for this reason, we use the category of AUS. But also in the bottom, on the left and right, we might have a few oncocytic cells, here a few cells, just two with lymphocytes. Maybe this might be a warting, but we have really only two uh, cells which are not enough. Or another cluster in which we have more evident oncocytic features. 
But I would like to stress again the previous uh, uh, concept. Uh, if we have, uh, as in the um, upper left, uh, this mucinous material, uh, we have to put the mucinous material alone in the category of AUS, uh, because again, this might be a mucosyl, so a benign condition, but also a mucopidermoid carcinoma. In the same category, we might put these uh, uh, few cells, for instance, in which you can see we have uh, a moderate cytoplasm, a fusiform, a spindle appearance, but they are not enough for any uh, further uh, uh, characterization or also a single cluster of uh, squamous cells. Again, this might be squamous metaplasia in a benign condition, but also a single cluster in the context of a squamous, for instance, uh, malignant entity. The, um, the risk of malignancy for uh, this category is uh, at around 20%, so between the risk of malignancy in the non-neoplastic and in the neoplastic uh, category. For the neoplastic category, we decided to subclassify these lesions into two different groups. Benign neoplasms reserved for clear-cut benign neoplasms. So for this reason, lesions in which we have a very high specificity for diagnosis such as pleomorphic adenoma, warting tumor, and salivary gland neoplasm of uncertain malignant potential. In the benign neoplasm, we included the pleomorphic adenoma, warting, oncocytoma, and several soft tissue tumors, like lipoma, schwannoma, lymphangioma, for instance, and hemangioma. You can see here two examples of how pleomorphic adenoma in the uh, upper uh, picture. We have this uh, chondromyxoid stromal component, uh, which is a cellular uh, chondromyxoid stromal component with myopithelial cells. Or uh, in the bottom, we have a detail from a pleomorphic adenoma with uh, some sort of squamous metaplasia. Other examples in the upper part, again, the chondromyxoid stromal component with these uh, feather edges, and you can see many myopithelial cells in it with this uh, spindle and fusiform appearance. In the bottom, on the left, we have an example of oncocytoma, in which we have uh, a diffuse um, uh, evidence of oncocytic cells with these uh, centrically located nuclei and uh, eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm, but in the right uh, we have an example of warting, uh, dirty background, uh, lymphocytes in the background, and uh, these uh, clusters uh, of oncocytic uh, uh, cells. This is another example of warting in which we have uh, this uh, dirty uh, and cystic debris, inflammatory cells and lymphocytes, and of course the oncocytic uh, clusters. So these are the three most important uh, elements that we have for warting tumor. In the same category, neoplasm, we included the SAMP. The definition was uh, as diagnostic of a neoplasm, neoplasm. So in these cases, we are not in doubt about uh, a neoplastic condition. However, a diagnosis of a specific entity cannot be made due sometimes to the nature of the lesions and an FNA. And furthermore, also because we are not able to recognize the capsular, for instance, and vascular invasion, a malignant neoplasm cannot be excluded. In this category of SAMP, we included the several different entities. Cellular benign neoplasms, such as cellular pleomorphic adenoma, neoplasms with monomorphic collisional cells, myopithelioma, basaloid neoplasms, oncocytic neoplasms, or neoplasms with some atypical features, and also, of course, some low-grade carcinomas which, for which it's very difficult to be, uh, identify um, directly on cytology. By the way, due to the complexity of SAMP, we decided to subclassify it in three different groups basaloid, oncocytic, and clear cell features neoplasms, especially because we focused not only on the cells, but also, as you can see from these tables, on the differences in the background.
for the oncocytic oncocytoid lesions, so for instance, you can see that we might have differences in the background, cystic background, so histiocytes, uh, proteinaceous material, inflammatory cells, and we reported all the possible differential diagnoses, uh, which are also described uh, with explanatory notes uh, and the possibility to perform immunostains, for instance, or, or uh, uh, ancillary technique uh, on, cytol on, on cytological material with feasible and reliable results. But also the mucinous background, and we have, of course, to consider MAC or some rare cases of warting tumor. Blood or no specific background, but also granular and vacuolated uh, cytoplasm, for instance, and you can see here mostly malignant entities, uh, acinic cell carcinoma, secretory carcinoma, and metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma, but also a crushable focal nuclear atypia, so some uh, uh, oncocytoid appearance uh, with a focal uh, um, nuclear atypia, salivary duct carcinoma, high grade MAC, metastatic uh, carcinoma. And we did the same for the basaloid group. Basaloid neoplas with the fibrillary stromal component, and you can see the differences, or basaloid with eye-line stromal component, or with mixed or other stromal component, or of course, also we might have some basaloid neoplas with the scant or no stromal component. And we reported all the possible and different differential diagnoses. Here you can see some examples. In the upper left, we have this large cluster of basaloid cells in this haphazard organiza organization of the cells, no um, polarity. And also you can see the scant cytoplasm and the round uh, oval nuclei with this basaloid appearance. In the upper right, we have the clear cell features. Uh, you can see there's a sort of back walls and clear appearance of the cytoplasm. And in the bottom right, um, left and right, you can see some oncocytoid features in these uh, clusters. The uh, other the risk of malignancy for the uh, SAMP is at around 35%. Another category is uh, suspicious for malignancy. Usually, we decided to use uh, this category in order to, of course, uh, uh, reduce the number of uh, um, in, in inadequate uh, diagnosis for uh, malignancy. The risk of malignancy for this category is at around 60%. And mostly we included in this category aspirate, which are highly suggestive of malignancy, but due to limitations in quality and quantity, it's not possible to provide a definitive diagnosis of malignancy. Often high-grade carcinoma with limited sampling or other limitations, but of course, not only, because we included, of course, also other entities. Basically, we can say that the suspicious for malignancy together with the SAMP and the AUS is part of the indeterminate categories, as, for instance, the different indeterminate lesions in the Bethesda. And you can see Bethesda target, and you can see that there are important differences between among AUS, SAMP, and suspicious for malignancy. Whilst in AUS we have a few cells in we and for these cells we are in doubts about a reactive or neoplastic nature of the cells. In SAMP, we are sure that this is a neoplastic condition, but we are not able to discriminate between benign or malignant neoplasm. neoplasm. In suspicious for malignancy, we are pretty sure that we have features of malignancy, but we are not completely confident due to the limitations uh, in a definitive diagnosis of malignancy. Also because I would like to remember that the, a diagnosis of malignancy is uh, associated with, of course, uh, a more aggressive uh, treatment. Instead of reading all this, uh, I would like to show you the pictures uh, and the criteria that we introduce. For instance, in the upper left, you can see a few cells uh, with the pleomorphic and irregular nuclei, very few, but very uh, irregular, so they should put uh, as a suspicious for malignancy. Or in the upper right, we have this uh, cluster but with also this um, uh, artifactual effect, uh, blood, you can see, and it's 
it's also impossible to um, evaluate exactly the morphological features. In the left bottom, you can see a single cluster of cells in which you are in favor of a specific entity. In this case, is a new papillomoid carcinoma, but it's not enough because we have uh, limited, of course, uh, aggregates of cells. And in the right bottom, you can see there's a discrete pattern of uh, um, atypical cells for which we are in favor of a lymphoma, but we do not have enough material for flow cytometry or for ancillary technique. So we might conclude that as a suspicious for malignancy. The malignant category is defined by aspirates, which are diagnostic of malignancy. We try to subclassify into the different types and the grades, low grade versus a grade, because this is important for the management and the treatment. We have to include also other malignancies, such as lymphoma, sarcoma, and metastasis, which are described also with different features in the atlas. Uh, in the atlas uh, for the malignant chapter, we have an introduction, then a detailed discussion of all these entities, arsenic, adenocystic, secretory carcinoma, salivary duct, MAC, car uh, carcinoma expleomorphic adenoma, epimyopithelial, myopithelial carcinoma, lymphopithelial carcinoma, high-grade transformation, small cell, and of course, uh, also metastasis. Um, um, you can see here some examples on liquid base, also cytology, and uh, of course, conventional cytology. In the upper left, we have a cluster which is in favor of a scenic cell carcinoma. You can see this granular and uh, back, uh, small vacuoles in the, uh, of course, the cytoplasm, which are uh, significantly in favor of this diagnosis. In the upper right, we have an example of uh, adenocystic carcinoma. You can see the finger-like and tubular structures in these uh, high-line globules, uh, which are completely acellular, uh, and also the cells are back-to-back -back, uh, at the periphery, which is a pretty typical uh, of uh, um, adenocystic carcinoma. In the middle, we have an epimyopithelial carcinoma in which you can recognize uh, the two different uh, nature of the cells, more uh, cleocell appearance, the abdominal and more ductal cells, uh, basaloid appearance uh, without the cytoplasm. In the, um, in the right bottom, we have a cluster for a MAC, from a MAC, in which you can recognize some uh, squamous intermediate cells, but also you can see here with the arrow of these two cells having this uh, backwards uh, because they are uh, mucus uh, producing uh, cells. Uh, so the combination of these uh, two different types of cells uh, is in favor of this diagnosis. Uh, and on the, um, on, the, um, on the left bottom, we have a cluster uh, uh, of uh, squamous cells uh, in favor of the uh, squamous lesions. Uh, usually the squamous lesions are metastatic localization. Uh, in this moment, the Milan system is an atlas with 10 chapters, with definitions, uh, with the criteria, over 40 contributing over authors, 182 pages, 109 color pictures, uh, and translations uh, in different languages. And it really seems that we are going global. In fact, the Milan system has gained uh, acceptance among cytopathologists. You can see on the left the Japanese version, and on the right, the the recent uh, Chinese version, but there is also um, a Turkish translation uh, and also some uh, um, a, a French translation for the French society. The major topic introduced in the Milan system are the diagnostic categories, of course, the risk of malignancy for the categories, the management strategies, the introduction of the concept of uh, atypia for salivary cytology, and also so the use of the uh, ancillary technique um, as a as an additional
If he wants to see his children, he will call the station. He will come and see his children. And then they will come and they come and they come and they come. Hey, hey. Call. Oh, hi. Why Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. May I continue or not? Um, over the uh, since the publication, over one hundred uh, cytological papers have been published confirming the risk of malignancy for the diagnostic categories. Uh, with a growing acceptance by the clinicians, and it was recently endorsed by the ASCO. Of course, to confirm the role of the Milan system, we have different meta-analytic studies. One of them was published by Professor Bellich on diagnostic cytopathology, including more than 18,000 uh, cases. You can see that they were distributed, distributed according to the Milan system, and also comparing the risk of malignancy in in the Milan system with the risk, of course, of malignancy in the review. Uh, recently, they published also a second review starting from a case and uh, um, based on the fact that the clinicians in a, a revised uh, case asking uh, ask them for uh, the classification of this uh, consultation into a Milan system category. This was the occasion for uh, the revision of the literature, which was extremely useful for the second edition of the Milan system. So in this golden age of the Milan system, why a second edition? Why a postman should ring twice? Because this is an evidence-based system. So the second edition, which is expected for, it would have been expected for fall 2022, then it is July 2023, will include new chapters also a chapter about ultrasound, new and more hotels, more pictures, uh, we replace uh, more than half of the pictures, the revisions uh, of the chapters uh, with, the, um, with the WHO uh, and the NAC 2022 updates, the changes in the risk of malignancy, and of course updates in the ancillary uh, chapter but due to the new genetic alterations. Um, and uh, um, this is the new uh, curve and the new uh, distribution of the different diagnostic categories with the risk of malignancy and the management. We had, of course, uh, some changes uh, for some of the categories. You can see uh, for the uh, neoplastic benign, a lower risk of malignancy, higher for suspicious for malignancy, 83%, and almost 100% for the uh, malignant category. The problem, uh, one of the problem was mostly for the category of atypia versus neoplasm. If we had to stay with this category or to uh, change, we decided according to the literature to maintain the subclassification into uh, for the indeterminate categories. So we included, we are including also in the second edition, the uh, concept of atypia and the subcategory of neoplasm subclassify into benign and SAMP. This is a table from the Milan system uh, second edition in which you can see that uh, for the atypia of undetermined significance, uh, we are firstly subclassify into cystic and non-cystic, uh, for cystic mucinous, uh, and so including uh, the all the non-neoplastic and neoplastic entities. Uh, and for the non-mucinous, uh, we have to specify if we have lymphocyte, if we have epithelial component, uh, and all the different type of epithelial component. So if squamous cells, oncocytic cells, basaloid, ascenic or spindle. And also for non-cystic, we have to consider a typical lymphoid proliferation and epithelial cell predominant with the same subclassification that we had in non-mucinous. We have to say that the average risk of malignancy now is at around 34%. Of course, uh, this is uh, based on the surgical follow-up uh, and from the from the series in which we have a surgical follow-up. Risk of neoplasm is at around 63%. We introduced the concept of risk of neoplasms. 
Then we introduce new tables uh, with the definition of the different scenarios and differential diagnosis. This is important because different type of AUS are associated with different risk of neoplasm and risk of malignancy. And new sample reports. For the category of neoplastic benign, this was used again for the classic benign neoplast. The risk of malignancy now is lower than 3%. We included pleomorphic adenoma, wartin, wartin lipoma, and schwannoma. We excluded the oncocytoma. These are the two examples of uh, um, pleomorphic adenoma and wartin tumor. For the SAMP, we stay with the definition, but in this case, the risk of malignancy, according to the revision, is lower, is at around 26%. And we again stay with the inclusion of benign neoplasm and some low grade carcinoma. But as we have a different type of the same SAMP and as uh, Peter Sellers uh, perform different uh, uh, characters uh, in uh, Dr. Strange lab, we have, uh, uh, we decided to introduce uh, uh, apart from the basaloid oncocytic and the clear cell neoplasms, also a four category, which is a, a category of the mixed features, because it's not always black or white, and we have the different shades of gray. But by the way, for an FNA to be competitive as a test, we need to reduce, of course, the number of indeterminate lesions uh, and expanding uh, the diagnosis of benign, um, of either benign or malignant. For instance, in this case, based on morphology alone, we can also, we can say that this is a SAMP and it's only with the support of ancillary technique and with immuno that we are able to classify this lesion as a malignant and in fact it was an acidic cell carcinoma. For the suspicious for malignancy category, we didn't uh, um, change it. Uh, we didn't change uh, um, significantly the criteria. But for the malignant category, we had uh, several updates from the new WHO and the NAC 2022. We included, of course, uh, all the cytological features uh, of the cancers, uh, including uh, also the low-grade cancers, and of course, also the high-grade cancers. It's important when possible to define the grade. So if it is a low-grade versus an high-grade malignancy, because this will influence the extent of surgery. A radical resection versus a limited resection, neck dissection, and facial nerve, of course, are sacrificed. We published a paper on cancer cytopathology, including 66 FNA cases of salivary carcinoma. They were reviewed by an international panel of 19 cytopathologists. And you can see that we have a very high um, overall uh, uh, accuracy, grading accuracy of 90%, especially for high grade and low grade entities, and especially for MAC. But it was uh, impossible to classify the, the indeterminate categories. We decided also to stay with the chapter of ancillary technique, mostly due to the recent advances in the genetic alterations. And also according to different papers like this by Dr. Joe, the reporting that all the possible technique, immuno, fish, sequencing are possible on cytology, on the different cytological material with the feasible and reliable results. For the immuno, we prepared the different tables for, you can see, the oncocytic pattern with all the entities, benign and malignant, and all the possible immunostains. We did the same for the basaloid pattern, including benign and malignant entities. And of course, for clear cell features, benign and malignant entities are the most important uh, uh, markers. But we have to remember that uh, we might have also some metastatic localization. And of course, there are some specific uh, immunostains uh, uh, which are associated with the possible site of uh, origin. 
This is from the Milan 2 and Dr. Belich, and you can see that uh, all the different uh, um, entities, uh, including not only malignant entities, might have some specific genetic alterations, uh, rearrangement, uh, fusion, amplification, uh, uh, hotspot uh, mutations, uh, which are in some cases uh, associated with 100% of them. For instance, uh, you know that in saccharotic carcinoma, in 100% of the cases, we have the uh, ETB6 and TRK3 uh, fusion, which is uh, peculiarly associated with this uh, secretory carcinoma. We also introduced the new genetic alteration studied in salivary cytology. For instance, the fact that the AP myopathy carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma might have plug one HMG2 expression, but also RAS uh, Q61R. The role of NR4A3 upregulation in ascenic cell carcinoma. MOC4 in secretory carcinoma or ALK fusion in random migrate the salivary gland and intraductal carcinoma, NOTCH1 in adenoid cystic carcinoma 10%, but also the recurrent MAP2C SS18 fusion in the microsecretory adenocarcinoma of the oral cavity. This is just an example of uh, the uh, use of uh, NR483 nuclear expression associated with dog in a case of acinic cell carcinoma, and it can be performed on uh, cytological material or cell block obtained from, of course, uh, the uh, cytological material. So in conclusion, we can say that the FNA has a very high diagnostic accuracy in salivary cytology. This is regardless of the classification system, but this is based only on the evaluation of the morphological criteria. By the way, a classification system may offer information for the management of these lesions. There is an improved relevance of the Milan system and also the uh, availability of new immunomarker and molecular profile um, and a significant impact uh, on cytology and uh, on the Milan system, because in this way, we might increase the accuracy of, cell, of fine needle aspiration, especially when we need to move a case from SAMP to malignancy or uh, to uh, specific entities. Important implication for the management, of course, which means at the end, the improvement of the patient care. There is a, a significant and important question. Is this the I noon of salivary cytology? So the Milan system against the descriptive classic cytology? Of course not, because we didn't change anything in the classical evaluation of the salivary cytology. We only um, put the well-known entities into categories defined by a risk of malignancy and a specific uh, clinical uh, management. And uh, this is uh, from the USCAP 2018 in Vancouver, the party for the publication uh, of, the, uh, of the Atlas. And uh, I really thank all of you for your attention and I'm open to any uh, question and discussion that, that you want to share with me about uh, salivary cytology and the Milan system. Thank you so much. No, non è condivisione. Hi. I see two questions here. The Milan system is quite simple and straightforward. Is there an American system or Okay, um, okay. Uh, is there an American system? Well, uh, concerning the Milan system, the Milan system is uh, itself a, um, a um, I can say, a uniform, 
is is a system created by is a joint classification system so there isn't an american system because it is a, a global and unique uh, system so we don't we we don't have uh, we don't have a uh, in italian or uh, an american system um, this uh, is uh, uh, a joint uh, uh, effort uh, including uh, people from all over the the, the world um, what features uh, are considering in uh, cytological grading of salivary gland malignancies? Uh, good question. Uh, uh, usually are the, the typical uh, uh, features that you use for grading uh, a malignancy. So if you have a severe, uh, a typical nuclei, uh, significant uh, force uh, chromatin, prominent uh, nuclei, uh, very uh, irregular and uh, typical uh, nuclear membrane, and uh, of course uh, also mitotic figures uh, and uh, necrotic uh, on the hemorrhagic uh, component. Uh, these are the, the most important uh, features that you, um, you use uh, for grading. And when you have some of them, you can say I grade the malignancy, which means uh, um, a more aggressive uh, treatment by the, uh, by the clinicians. Um, I don't see uh, the if there is a, another Q and A um, point. Uh, I I see only these uh, two questions. Uh, is there something else? Dan? No, I think that was all the questions. Um, so again. Thanks so much uh, to everybody, unless there's any more questions. Yeah, thanks so much to everyone who participated. Again, the recording will be available um, in uh, probably by tomorrow for those who want to listen to it again. Um, and uh, we'll I think that there is another question. Ah, oh, no, thank you very much. No, just okay. thank you very much. Um, and so we will see all of you again on Thursday. Okay. All right, thanks everyone. Okay. Bye -bye. Ciao. ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. All right, bye.